I look at the relationship between people and systems, not just in spinal surgery, but all across medicine. I've uh, published quite a lot in, um, recently in robotic surgery. Um, Donnie and I have been working, and the, the rest of the CEDAS team have been working on uh, looking at uh, some data that he's going to present a bit later. Um, my disclosure is that, uh, that we've uh, recently uh, worked with Mectronic uh, on, on a grant looking at this, uh, this specific stuff. Otherwise, no other disclosures. Um, my these are my objectives, um, and I'd rather than read them out, I thought a nice summary was this difference between how we design the world and the experience of our users. So, for example, when we do a randomized controlled trial, um, it's with a, a group of people who we know very, very carefully and have, have worked, on, uh, worked with to define the methods. As soon as we sort of spread that to other people not involved in this, there's going to be adaptions and changes that may not reflect uh, our original randomized control trial. If you like some of the problems that we were talking, uh, that the last speaker was talking about with the dip between, um, uh, you know, between the trial, uh, between uh, between different trials. Um, uh, and so there's a difference between how we would like to see the world and how the world actually is. Um, and this, this has a, so, um, so what I do is what's called human factors. It looks at the relationship between people and systems, which is complex and interacting. If we think about people at the center of the system, um, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're you guys. You run the system, you keep it safe, you make things work within tasks that vary, technologies that vary, organizations that vary, and environments that vary. If you change a technology, it, change what, it changes what people do, it changes the right uh, environment in which that te technology is gonna work. Look at the number of, look at the size of our equipment and the size of our operating rooms nowadays. We need bigger operating rooms to incorporate all the uh, technology that we've included. We, it changes the tasks, not just for the surgeons, but for the whole surgical team, which then changes the people we need to roster in our operating rooms to get to achieve the performance that we would like to achieve because a scrub tech who's used to working in you know, upper GI surgery cannot suddenly go into robotic surgery and start doing it as efficiently. The same we, the same we find with image-guided surgery. Um, and so all of these things interact. So the point here is that technology changes all sorts of other things about the system. And my research is trying to understand what those things are, because if we don't think about them, they'll trip us up in all sorts of different ways. Um, here's a way to think about humans and design. We think that, uh, we think that, that if we make a mistake, it's our fault. Well, if you've ever opened a door or tried to open a door, pull a handle on a door and found actually that it pushes the other way, you'll recognize that that's a design that was telling you to pull when it meant push. Here's a, here a design of a device that under certain situations um, might, uh, might, um, might injure somebody um, because it can be reversed. And I say this because this, this happened. Um, it can be reversed because when you come to inject it, um, you, uh, it's, it's, it's symmetrical, and so within certain, certain situations, if you're under time pressure, if you're stressed, if, you're, um, if somebody hands it to you the wrong way around, it can be reversed. This design does not allow that to happen, because it, uh, and so you can design out that particular error mode. So the point here is that if we think carefully about how people use devices, we can prevent all sorts of different errors. Alternatively, if we don't, we can build those in. Um, here's, a, here's another particular model around, and based on something else that's come up, why people do or don't use technology. I bet you uh, a good proportion of you have kitchens that are full of devices that you bought that you thought would be really great, and actually you end up not using. Um, that's this difference between perceived ease of use um, and perceived usefulness. In other words, uh, so, so a juicer can be, you know, you, you buy it because you think, oh, that'll be really easy to use. It'll mean that I can juice my, uh, juice my oranges uh, really quickly. But actually, it turns out that the benefits of juicing oranges quickly are not outweighed by the massive pain it is when you have to come to clean it. Uh, and so as a result, a lot of our devices in our kitchens and in all sorts of our other areas, the, the, uh, the, 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 the benefits don't outweigh, uh, sorry, don't outweigh the complexity of, uh, of using them. And every single technology increases complexity in some way, I think. 
I'm I'm, may, I'm open to uh, to to uh, to other suggestions otherwise. But you know, our, our iPhones they're great. They enable us to do all sorts of different things. But our lives are more complex because everywhere we everywhere we go, we've got to have charging cables and and think about how we're going to charge our phone, which adds to the complexity of life. So this is one of the reasons why one of the things you hear from technologists is, oh, we've got a, you know, our device is amazing, but our users don't use it. Well, that's probably because they don't perceive it as being, uh, as the, the difficulty of using it outweighing the, uh, the benefits that they see. This also goes, by the way, across if you have nurses who are, who are using a device for the benefit of a physician or otherwise that it can be difficult to convince one group to do a job that makes another group's life easier. Um, to expand on this, automation is not always a good idea. We know from all sorts of areas, including aviation and, and consumer products, around some of the, mis, the sort of misconceptions around technology. Technology often doesn't... Um, doesn't reduce our workload, it actually it can, uh, um, it can increase workload. It doesn't reduce the skills we need because we need the original skills plus we need all the skills to operate the technology. It doesn't make our life easier necessarily because we've got to, um, because not, not only have we got to do the task and monitor the task, we've also got to monitor the technology, what the technology is doing. Um, what the, re the thing you don't want to hear on an aircraft cockpit is, and you do hear it regularly, I, I'm, I'm told, is what's it doing now? So, the, so not only with automated cockpits, not only do we have to have pilots who fly the plane, we have to have them understanding in incredible amounts of detail how to operate the technology, which has meant that our training programs have massively increased. And by the way, it means that it's created all new, new sorts of error. So again, there's so much to this. I'm going to skip over that. But just to say, there are all sorts of traps that technology misleads us into. Um, and a little bit of application of some of these principles, you can navigate around them. Um, so, I'm going to, so the next idea is that I'm going to expand in a little bit more detail is workers imagined versus workers done. So workers imagined sort of looks like this. Does that look like a real operating room to you? So this is a real operating room. And this is work as done. OK, so when we think about technology, and, and, and I hope it's not, not uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope it's not wrong of me to say, but all the discussions we talked about this morning haven't been really embracing actually how dirty and complex and difficult um, and imperfect working in healthcare systems is. Now, that's not going to go away. Because healthcare is so complex, we're always going to be working in situations that aren't that don't necessarily that aren't necessarily ideal. And so we've got to we've got to understand that and not design for work as imagined, but work as done. So the assumption, you know, so this is the difference between theoretical and practical. We think that things are simplistic and clear, and actually our processes in healthcare are complex, opaque, and unknown. If you talk to somebody about all the different things that happen in, you know, about in, even in an operating room, but in a in a hospital system to get a patient through their care, you will be in, you will very quickly come across assumptions that you made that are in, incorrect. You got any idea? Have you ever? How many of you have been down to a sterile processing where your instrument, the instruments that you use every day, are processed and got and got back to you? Have you any idea about how that system works? Um, so if you don't, then we don't know how. You know anyway. Um, so um, <laughs> uh, it's uh, we, um, we we consider work as being independent or isolated, and actually all these things are you know uh, the the care of one patient impacts on the care of another patient. The care of these sorts of patients impact on the care of these sorts of patients. So on different specialties have to compete for resources. So they're in, in, they're, they're interdependent and interacting. It's, we think about it as technical and deterministic when actually our systems are socio-technical. They, uh, they, uh, they exist at the boundary between people and technologies. And, and, uh, and that's, that's for specific reasons. But to think that people aren't going to be involved in, uh, you know, in, in the use of technology and how all those things interact is, uh, 
is incorrect. And rather than everything being focused on safety and patient outcomes or even bureaucracy, all, what we're trying to do all the time is balance safety and cost and throughput. Um, and so there isn't, uh, there isn't one thing that we're trying to do all the time. Every single um, practitioner, pretty much every operation they're doing or every, um, you know, every nurse every day has to be balancing safety and cost and throughput. You do this when you're driving. This is, what, uh, this is one of the things that helps you decide on how fast you're going to drive. Right, what's the risks of either crashing or getting caught? What's the, uh, you know, what's the cost in terms of either the fines that I might get or the extra fuel that I might burn versus the fact that I'm going to get there faster. Um, and again, we can go on. Protocols and checklists, these are very popular, but they can't account for all eventualities. Standardized work doesn't address the fact that we need to be adaptable, flexible, efficient, and innovative. Um, we talk about evidence bases, but most of what we do is, is, uh, is not based on evidence, and people don't change their behavior based on evidence. Um, we need to think about training. We like to think training is effective, but um, one of the things that we need to look at is what we're training, when and how. Um, I was I'm always fascinated by the experience that we get from using technology um, and, and learning uh, you know, from teams because we know that teams over time uh, reduce their learning curve. What is it that they're learning within that learning curve? What experience? You know, what's, what is it they're getting when they do 10 operations? That might, if we knew that, then maybe we could feed that into training and shortcut that somehow. Okay, um, so, so there's lots and lots and lots of research in all sorts of areas um, that, that, start, that has tried to address this through direct observation. By the way, uh, so this is, uh, these are three, uh, um, uh, and this is, <laughs> this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because tasks and teams and technologies interact. So if you introduce a new technology, um, or um, then it changes the nature of teamwork. Um, for example, robotic surgery um, has very different teamwork work requirements for success um, in comparison to cardiac surgery or uh, orthopedic surgery. Um, this is some work that Don Donielle's going to, um, uh, going to expand on. Um, this is looking at disruptions we get in IGS image-guided image technology, um, really where it's the uh, the management of instruments or the absence of staff when they're needed that can create flow disruptions. And when we look at the equipment that's needed, um, this is dominated by camera and calibration problems. Um, uh, and we also find when we look at this, the difference between experts and novices, that the expert surgeons are actually better at, co at coordinating, at getting everyone to do the right thing at the right time to orchestrate everything that's needed to get the tech going. This is very different skill from, from what you guys are learning when you're operating the machines and, and you're, you know, you're learning the basic skills of surgery. Actually, this is about managing the team. Um, and, uh, and expert uh, IGS techs, we find um, that the experts are better at that piece of managing and coordinating, but they're also good at, at dealing with the equipment. Um, and then if we want to expand that idea more, uh, this is some work I did years ago looking at pit stops and how teamwork, teams just don't suddenly arise, that we can think about the structure of teamwork. Think about leadership, which has to change how we involve people. Um, all the, pre the, the, the talk of preparation was really was fantastic earlier on, but preparing ourselves isn't sufficient. We need to prepare as a team. We need to do a briefing. Um, we need to think about what, ch what role checklists have. Checklists are not a universal panacea, but they can be incredibly helpful. We need to think about what we do, when, and in what sequence. Uh, and all of these things are available for us to design and think about so that we can get a better, uh, the better use of technology, better, uh, better, safer, faster, more efficient processes. It just takes time to do that. Um, so the future, uh, and I was asked to sort of so I'm going to speculate a little bit on the future of this. Increasing, this is all about increasing technology. The more technologies you have and the more different treatment op options are available makes it more difficult. It makes it more difficult to make decisions about what the right course of treatment is, about what the right things to do are. Um, it adds complexity. It requires extra skill. Um, at the same time, we have, pre we have downward pressures on things like efficiency and safety. 
um, the the new techniques and and challenges and treatment modes and te uh, and uh, re uh, require new skills. They require us to do different things. They require us to make different decisions. They require different training, and they will introduce new types of errors. Um, we, <laughs> but they've all got to be. Con uh, but a lot of this has to be con conducted within workspace and organisational constraints. The size of our operating rooms can't change to keep up with the technology that we're trying to put in them. So what does that mean for thinking forward for, for the future about how we, how we design the size of our operating rooms, which, by the way, is a project I'm involved in at the moment. Um, uh, and, 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 and also we're getting, as, as patients get involved more in their care, where they get their information from and what about is going to be really, really challenging for us. So, so that's that social thing of how we, how we think about um, how care is going to be shaped in the future. And this, of course, you can see within the robotic surgery um, where, um, where people decide that they want to have robotic surgery, whether it's better for them or not. And there's lots of evidence that in certain situations, it's, it's actually, you know, it might be worse. Okay, so, and all of these things are interacting and compounding. They sit on each other and make things more and more and more complex. So thinking around them by thinking about how we can standardize not what people do, but the equipment, the environment, the technology, and the tools that they do, because actually human variability is an important part of uh, safety. Um, how we can improve, improve the, the error proofing of designs, um, how we can improve training of procedures, not only for surgeons, but for the whole team. Because if you guys want to be successful, it's not just about how good you are. You've got to have a team who are able to use the image of guided tech and help you through those, the, the, through those surgeries. Um, how we can integrate all these things better and indeed understand, pre predict, and intervene early. Um, so that's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much.